I am Ariel Cates. I'm the Director of Programming at Village Preservation, and I'm so glad that all of you are here with us this evening. Um, just a little bit about Village Preservation. We have been documenting, celebrating, and fighting for the preservation of Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo since 1980. We work to expand and extend landmark and zoning protections and stop inappropriate development, while also encouraging appropriate development in our neighborhoods. We host roughly 75 programs a year, all of which are now virtual and most of which are free and open to the public. Our events are meant to illuminate the cultural and architectural heritage, history and depth and the value of preservation in our communities. We're a nonprofit membership based organization. So your involvement and support mean the world to us. You can learn more at our marvelous new website, villagepreservation.org. And please consider becoming a member or making a donation if you're able at villagepreservation.org slash donate. Okay, so a little bit of Zoom protocol. Uh, I'm gonna turn my video off so I won't be visible during the event, but I will be here. Uh, please feel free to use the chat to say hi. Uh, tell me where you're joining from or to raise any issues or anything like that. But if you have questions specifically for our speakers, please use the Q&A function below, which you can do at any point during the talk, uh, and we'll get to as many of those as possible. So this has certainly been an unprecedented year for voting. Uh, and so too was 1920 when the 19th Amendment was passed and the American Civil Liberties Union was formed. So we are very delighted uh, to be joined by our speakers tonight who will illuminate much of this for us, I know. Um, Dr. Amy Aronson is professor and chair of communication and media studies at Fordham University. She has published, edited, and spoken broadly, and her latest book, Crystal Eastman, A Revolutionary Life, recovers the story of the 20th century feminist, labor lawyer, anti-war activist, and radical journalist who engineered the founding of the ACLU. Susan N. Herman is president of the American Civil Liberties Union and Centennial Professor of Law at Brooklyn Law School, where she teaches courses in constitutional law and criminal procedure and a current seminar called COVID-19 and the Constitution. She writes and speaks extensively and has participated in Supreme Court litigation. So I will turn it over to both of you. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much, Ariel. I'm gonna get us started. I, just, I am so honored to be here um, and to share this Zoom room with the amazing Susan Herman. Um, it's gonna seem a bit uh, concrete, literally, to start my talk where I'm gonna start it, but please bear with me. Um, I'm going to start with a building. Specifically, I'm gonna start with this building, 75th Avenue on the corner of 13th Street. This building was headquarters to two anti-war organizations that Crystal Eastman led in the World War I era, one of which directly gave rise to the nascent ACLU. But even more than that, this building has also been headquarters to a dazzling array of social change organizations across its history. For over 100 years, it's been a nexus of progressive organizing and activism. That's why I'm starting there. Because that building serves as a kind of a metaphor for the multi-movement politics that characterized Crystal Eastman's career, and indeed the whole culture of Greenwich Village in which she lived out the heart of it. The Landmarks Preservation Society is currently seeking landmark status for 75th Avenue and a surrounding cluster of buildings, which separately and together hold a remarkable place in the history of New York and in the history of the United States, in social and political movements, in publishing, and in the arts. For one example, the building housed the headquarters of the NAACP, the oldest and largest national African-American civil rights organization in the nation, founded February 1909. It was also home to the Crisis Magazine from 1914 until the mid 1920s, the most vital published voice for the civil rights movement in America for a century. Under the editorship of W.E.B. Du Bois, the magazine, like the organization, discussed the racism in this country that has proceeded with shocking consistency to this day. Both focused attention on murderous race-based violence, particularly but not exclusively lynchings. Both discussed discrimination in voting housing and employment faced by African-Americans. Both 
raised the proliferation of demeaning, derogatory, dehumanizing representations of Black Americans in what was then the expanding electronic media of the early 20th century. Both led national protests against the now infamous film, The Birth of a Nation, for example, which was first released in 1915, exactly when Eastman was working in that building as a leader in the international peace movement. There are many more examples I could give, and I will refer you to the Landmark Society for more info, but suffice it to say that 75th Avenue deserves near iconic status as a center for nation-changing, indeed world-changing political organizing. It's no wonder Crystal Eastman found her professional home there. Today, Crystal Eastman might well be seen as what we call an intersectional activist. By that, I mean, she identified with multiple social justice movements spanning issues and organizations. And from the dawn of her public life, right here in New York City, she worked to bring these various struggles together to create a coalition identity and to mobilize public actions to combat linked injustices and to combat them in concert. Eastman was a central figure in many of the most important social justice movements of the 20th century, labor, feminism, internationalism, free speech, peace. She was a renowned labor lawyer, a leading suffragist, and the most prominent radical international peace activist in the country. She was a radical journalist and a publisher with international reach and a feminist so vocal and so uncompromising that some in the press called her the most dangerous woman in America. She left a major institutional legacy as well. In addition to the peace organizations that we'll discuss in more detail shortly, Eastman drafted, oops, I'm sorry, I got my, sorry. Eastman, sorry, um, Eastman drafted the first uh, workers' compensation law in the United States, which soon became a model for many other areas. She co-founded the National Women's Party, the first women's political party in the world, and later would be credited as a co-author of the Equal Rights Amendment, the party's signature post-suffrage goal. After World War I, Eastman co-published the revolutionary Liberator magazine, with her brother Max Eastman, who despite a hard right turn that he took in his politics in midlife, is still remembered today from his glory days as a village institution. Thanks in significant part to his sister's contacts and local credibility, in 1912, Max was drafted by a band of downtown artists and intellectuals become, to become editor of the Masses magazine, the irreverent village magazine that would become an emblem and an engine of cultural rebellion in the years prior to the war. The magazine was graphically innovative, it was politically leftist, and it prided itself on its sense of humor. It made Max Eastman one of the most famous radicals in American history, and he often said that the birth of the masses coincided with the birth of Greenwich Village as a self-conscious entity. But for Crystal, the Liberator was both more revolutionary and more life-changing. Its birth coincided with her becoming a working parent in a two-career couple and it offered her really the only flexibility combined with job security that she would ever have as she attempted to blaze that trail. Crystal advocated and tried to live in real time a politics of private life that was as far reaching as her public agenda. She was divorced in 1916 after learning of her husband's infidelity, but she refused alimony. Whoops, sorry. She refused alimony, telling newspapers at the time that, quote, no self-respecting feminist would accept alimony. It is a relic of the past. Marriage, she said, is a link, not a handcuff, a link, not a chain. Later that year, she married Walter Fuller, an English pacifist and publicist, the man who would become the father of her two, of her two children. Whoops, sorry. That's when she applied, her, she applied herself in earnest to finding solutions to feminist dilemmas in family life that are still pressing today. Reproductive rights, paid parental leave, economic partnership within marriage, wages, wages for housework, shared housekeeping and childcare, feminist masculinity, single motherhood by choice, and work family balance. In fact, in one of her unpublished manuscripts, she proposed a newspaper column about the silenced longing of married mothers for substantive work outside the home a yearning that anticipates Betty Friedan's problem that has no name, nearly half a century before the breakthrough of the feminine mystique in 1963. And in all this work, Eastman tried to bridge different movements. She talked about gender with the socialists and the anti-militarists, about class and imperialism, internationalism, and also maternalism with the feminists. 
At juncture after juncture in her political career, she pushed to enlarge connections among social justice movements by forging ties among shared experiences of inequality. She repeatedly tried to link organizational agendas and collective actions under one vast emancipatory rubric. That's why thinking about all these issues ranging across multiple arenas and spheres brings me back to 75th Avenue as a site, as a metaphor, and also as a crucible of her activist career. That building was home to the Women's Peace Party, today the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Eastman helped organize a, natural, a national convention of feminists and peace activists in January 1915 that resulted in the formation of the group. She helped recruit Jane Addams, the public philosopher and internationally esteemed champion of women's suffrage and world peace to head the national organization while she remained head of the first and more audacious New York City branch. From its 75th Avenue offices, it operated a nationwide press service, organized innovative demonstrations, open air meetings and congressional hearings, and published its controversial periodical Four Lights magazine. From its doorstep, Eastman led rallies drawing hundreds of people and called on the nation to claim its destiny as the prime mover of permanent international peace. Under her leadership, the group's membership grew to 50,000 by 1916. At nearly the same time, she also helped to launch the American Union Against Militarism in that building. As executive secretary, Eastman operated as a policy innovator and a media activist, masterminding many of the group's most daring and innovative direct action campaigns. For Eastman, the international peace movement itself represented a convergence of many efforts in which she was involved as a feminist, as a socialist, and as a reformer. Through these organizations, she and her circle hoped to not only rally against the war, but to develop an altogether new kind of peace movement. She and her colleagues departed from prior peace organizations that limited themselves to more genteel behind the scenes lobbying and attempted to influence public opinion in print and oratory. They also abandoned contemporary capitalist peace groups that argued against war because of its high cost and economic disruptions. Whoops, sorry. Instead, both organizations intended to establish a left-leaning coalition that harnessed the energy and insight of progressive reform, of labor unionism, of suffragism, and of the anti-war struggles themselves. Utilizing direct action tactics and modern publicity strategies, they hoped to achieve the dual objectives of peace and justice, both locally and globally. In doing so, Eastman believed the new peace movement could usher in a new world order. It was an incredibly compelling vision to her and one that had been cultivated in no small part through her life and experiences in Greenwich Village. The village in all its transformative energies, its social and political and artistic experimentation, its culture of talk and debate and protest and hope helped to shape how she wanted the world to be. Eastman was a 1907 graduate of NYU Law School then an incubator and a haven of women attorneys at the time. When many other schools were closed to women, um, NYU had been accepting women for more than 15 years. And by the time she graduated, it was on track to graduate more women lawyers than any other school in the country. While in law school, Eastman worked at the Greenwich House Settlement located at 26 Jones Street. Greenwich House was ensconced in one of New York's most congested immigrant neighborhoods at the time. On that block alone lived some 1,400 people of 26 nationalities, all in dilapidated tenements and boarding houses interspersed with five salty saloons. Settlement houses were designed to let reformers live among the poor as their neighbors. They intended to foster cross-class bonds of understanding and shared participation in community building, social improvement, problem solving. Like Greenwich House, many settlement houses were established and staffed by a new generation of educated women, many of whom responded to the urgency of emergent social problems with research, philanthropy, and new initiatives in advocacy. As a result, the settlements became virtual training grounds for educated new women who were determined to create a political and a communal place for themselves in the new world. In the world. Greenwich House is where Eastman developed or solidified relationships with many of the people who would become her colleagues and mentors in labor, suffrage, and peace. She developed her relationship with Lillian Wald, founder of the nearby Henry Street Settlement and Visiting Nurse Service of New York. 
Eastman and Wald would work together closely in the American Union against militarism and run into conflict over the civil liberties struggle and the founding of the ACLU. She also deepened what would eventually become a rocky relationship with Florence Kelly, the social worker, attorney, and general secretary of the National Consumers League, who opposed Eastman over the ERA. And she grew closer with Jane Addams, with whom she would work, if not always easily, in virtually all the great movements of her life. More generally, the free-spirited street and social life of the village shaped Eastman's vision and her goals. When she first moved downtown in the fall of 1905, New York's first underground subway did not extend regular service into the area. That wouldn't happen until 1917. As a result, the area was a place apart, yet teeming with a mix of forward-looking people. And political societies, social clubs, conversational salons, Sorry, uh, conversational salons, notably the one famously held by Mabel Dodge, fostered a culture of free and provocative talk among them. From 1913 to 16, Dodge hosted Wednesday evenings at her mansion on 23 Fifth Avenue to discuss avant-garde ideas in the arts, politics, and society. Revolutionary at the time, salon topics ranged from uh, A.A. Brill, the psychoanalyst, discussing ideas of Sigmund Freud, or Emma Goldman presenting an anarchist view of working class struggles and beyond. Such free talk characterized the village milieu, bolstering its long associations with rebellion and bohemian creativity that remain with it today. In fact, freedom itself was understood in part as the fundamental right to say whatever one sought and thought and felt. And not just on Wednesdays at Mabel Dodge's home, but everywhere, anytime and often. Sorry. At Polly's, a storied watering hole in the basement at 139 McDougal Street, or at the Liberal Club upstairs, at frequent community gatherings and spaghetti dinners and costume balls. For women particularly, gender equality could be experienced as a freedom from the habitual restraints of feminine modesty and feminine deference and feminine virtue. Beginning in 1912, Eastman and a group of downtown women began meeting on alternate Saturdays for lunch and unfettered talk as the Heterodoxy Club. Uh, as none other than Mabel Dodge herself described it, heterodoxy was a group of unorthodox women, unafraid to speak up and act up, quote, women who did things and did them openly. This culture built around the absolute right to free talk probably jibed with political and legal ideas about fundamental rights to free speech, free expression, and political protest. I suspect they helped drive Eastman's certainty about the living principles embodied in the civil rights, uh, the civil liberties struggle soon to come. Susan will tell you more about the organization that rose to meet that struggle, but I will conclude by telling you a little bit about the specific in-house struggle within the American Union Against Militarism that gave rise to the founding of the ACLU. It starts with US entry into World War I. When President Wilson presented the Declaration of War to Congress on April 2nd, 1917, he made it clear that protest would no longer be tolerated. Quote, if there should be disloyalty, he said in his war message, it will be dealt with the firm hand of stern repression. Within a week, the administration had founded the Committee on Public Information, launching an unprecedented government propaganda campaign to both cultivate and control the US narrative about the war. The agency's more than 35 departments would include divisions for both news and pictorial publicity. The CPI also maintained a censorship board, which, which issued a voluntary censorship code under which editors agreed not to print material that might aid the enemy, that is, by compromising or contradicting the desired narrative of the US government. Whoop. George Creel, an investigative newspaper man and strong Wilson backer in both 1912 and 1916, was in charge of the whole operation. In his 1920 book, he characterized the work of the CPI as, quote, a plain publicity proposition a vast entertainment and sale, enterprise and salesmanship, the world's greatest adventure in advertising, unquote. But laws were put in place too. It wasn't just spin control. In June 1917, Congress passed the Espionage Act, which suspended free speech and assembly in the name of national security. That law was supplemented by the Sedition Act of 1918, which set prison terms for anyone convicted of obstructing the war effort, including by expressing anti-war opinions. 
The president justified the, cen the censorship as essential to public safety in a time of national emergency. He told Max, Max Eastman that the wholly exceptional moment made it, quote, legitimate to regard things which would in ordinary circumstances be very dangerous to the public welfare, end quote. To Crystal and her colleagues, these laws were blatantly anti-democratic and like the wartime summer censorship laws passed quickly in Britain when the war began in 1914, they seemed clearly calculated to control domestic opposition to whatever the government saw fit to do. The US Post Office Department became a leading force for suppression. The day after the Espionage Act was passed, Postmaster General Albert Burleson alerted post, office nation, post offices nationwide to keep tabs on any publication that could either embarrass or impede the government in conducting the war. He offered no clear definitions to accompany his edict. Within weeks, anti-war publications across the political spectrum, from mainstream liberal magazines to the socialist press, were seized or blocked from the mail. Many ordinary Americans involved themselves in the national campaign to enforce patriotism as well. In February of 1917, a Chicago advertising executive named Albert A.M. Briggs visited the US Justice Department with a proposal to organize the nation's businessmen into a clandestine force of volunteer surveillance agents. With the declaration of war in April, the idea won rapid approval and by the summer of 1917, the nascent FBI facilitated the launch of the American Protective League. This was a national network headquartered in Washington through which thousands of Americans conducted surveillance to identify those suspected of disloyalty. The APL grew rapidly, counting over 200,000 citizen spies in 600 cities by the end of its first year. At times, they fomented violence. Mobs at times tarred and feathered, even lynched those seen as or suspected of being war critics. Although members were ordinary volunteers, the League effectively functioned as an arm of the US government. They carried membership cards and identification badges from the Department of Justice. The climate of wartime repression affected every movement with which Crystal Eastman was involved. The National Woman's Party suffragists then picketing the White House for the vote, birth control advocates, anti-war activists, progressives, socialists, and internationalists. The same day the Espionage Act was passed, the Four Lights, that magazine of the Women's Peace Party of New York, was seized from the mail. Two weeks later, the masses was similarly declared unmailable. Crystal raised $30,000 in bail money, $20,000 for her brother, and $10,000 for each of his co-defendants. The trial of Max Eastman and, the mass and his masses colleagues was the country's first major test of free speech in wartime, but it would not be the last. In all, 44 US newspapers and magazines would run afoul of the new laws suppressing publication during 1917 alone, and another 30 maintained themselves only by agreeing to, pr to print nothing about the war. In less than four, the four years between the passage of the Espionage Act and 1921, when Max and Crystal Eastman gave the Liberator to the Workers' Party, the federal government com commenced prosecutions over, over more than 2,000 magazines, punishing anyone whose words or deeds were seen as intentionally interfering with military operations. After Max was charged, the AUAM Executive Board wired President Wilson to warn of profound long-term consequences to the very spirit and soul of democracy Quote, it is possible, they told him, that the moral damage to our democracy in this war may become more serious than the physical or national losses incurred, end quote. The next day, the AUM met in an emergency session. Emotions were running high and internal frictions began to surface as their established political agenda, as well as their methods of protest and pursuing it, were becoming illegal. But they agreed to carry on. They established a Legal Defense League whose main function was to prevent prosecution of critics of the administration and its war policies. Then, when Congress soon passed the Selective Service Act, legalizing the draft, the union established a bureau to provide information who, to those who sought to become conscientious objectors. A new classification of exemption from the draft on the basis of conscience. Soon, Eastman argued that a committee of lawyers should be added to press the case for conscientious objectors to the draft in American courts. A month later, legal complaint bureaus staffed by volunteer, volunteer attorneys opened in large cities across the US. 
Among the lawyers who offered their services free of charge was Eastman herself. She told the New York Times, quote, it is high time that all honest liberals in this country, whether for or against the war, realize that all that is real in American democracy is in danger today, end quote. She urged the American Union to design actions certain to elicit repression so they could produce test cases to take into the courts. The next month, the group called free press luncheons, drawing nearly 100 editors, journalists, magazine writers, and attorneys, including Clarence Darrow and Morris Hilquit, the five-time socialist candidate for Congress and the first socialist ever to run for mayor of New York City. The lawyers went to Washington to talk with administration officials, but Wilson refused to see them. They went to see Postmaster General Burleson, but he refused to divulge anything about the standards he was using to exclude material from the mails. These successive actions touched off divisions within the American Union that by then had been simmering for months. To summon the leadership, their work seemed like a challenge to the US government authority that they were not comfortable making. Just as the legal complaint bureaus for the, uh, for the COs were formally launching across the United States, Eastman received letters of, of resignation from both Lillian Wald, president of the American Union, and her dear friend and longtime champion, the progressive editor, Paul Kellogg. The resignations presented a major crisis to the union and in different ways to Crystal herself. To lose Wall, the union's well-respected chairman, and Kellogg, one of the best known social welfare reformers in the country, would be to sacrifice not only their insight and guidance, but also their credibility, qualities that had only become more essential to the organization since the declaration of war. Wald's disaffection from the union was particularly connected to Eastman herself. Wald publicly criticized what she saw as Eastman's, quote, impulsive radicalism. And she told the New York Times that, quote, much as I like her personally, she is more than I can manage single-handed. Wald later remarked that Eastman's exceptional fire and imagination was, quote, often impatient of more sober counsels. Wald concluded that to ally herself with such controversial people and policies would threaten everything she felt she needed to successfully pursue her broader reform agenda after the war. Like Kellogg, she was a social worker, dependent on respect and largesse to accomplish her social goals. Quote, there are so many things that I must plead for, she told Jane Addams, that I cannot throw away any part of my reputation for good judgment, end quote. But Eastman could not abandon the AUM's world-changing mission. And she saw the progress of peace and internationalism now as fully dependent on the maintenance of civil liberties, essentially as national, natural rights. In an effort to save both the goals she venerated and the actions she believed were indispensable to achieving them, she began a one-woman internal lobbying campaign to mediate the conflict that was tearing the American Union apart. Ultimately, she proposed an 11th hour solution, create a single legal bureau for the maintenance of fundamental rights in wartime, free press, free speech, freedom of assembly, and liberty of conscience. All the civil liberties work would continue, but be moved into a separate entity, the Civil Liberties Bureau. It would function as a collaborating group with the AUAM and be located in the same building at 75th Avenue. It was a structural solution to an elemental problem that was threatening to rupture the union from the inside. With her proposal, those members of the union who wanted to emphasize internationalist peacemaking were satisfied that the civil liberties work would not damage their interests and credibility. While those who emphasized the need to challenge government propaganda and the suppression of dissent would now have a formal and formidable organization through which to do it. In July 1917, the American Union Against the Militarism announced the formation of the Civil Liberties Bureau. By October 9th, the Bureau became the National Civil Liberties Bureau and established an executive committee structure of its own. Letterhead for the new organization showed St. Louis social worker Roger Baldwin as director. Susan will pick up the story from there, but first a brief coda. For Eastman, the establishment of the new organization ultimately represented a piercing loss. By September 1917, Lillian Wald resigned for good, and Eastman responded by trying to reabsorb the Civil Liberties Bureau back into the AUAM. She wanted to return citizen protest and the civil liberties fight to the larger struggle to secure world democracy and international federation, a United States of the world, as she called it. And it's worth noting that this move would have returned the new bureau under her organizational control as well. 
but she would never serve as executive director of the nascent ACLU as she wanted. On this exact date, in fact, November 17th, in 1917, she resigned from the AUAM entirely. Two main forces caused this to happen. Whoop. Sorry. Eastman's move to the left in pursuit of internationalism, her support for the Russian Revolution in 1917, particularly after the Bolsheviks quickly agreed to a peace treaty with Germany, this provided the reason. And the birth of her first child in mid-1917, after a difficult delivery and long recovery period, this provided the opportunity to edge her out of the organizational leadership of the AUAM. The American Union suspended its work shortly, shortly after Eastman's departure, while the Civil Liberties Bureau lived on, thriving illustrious, illustriously as the ACLU. But now it belonged to Roger Baldwin, not Crystal Eastman. Deeply imprinted with Baldwin's emphasis, the Civil Liberties fight developed the distinctly American bearing that it carries today. While the organization stands as a shining hallmark of national philosophy and character, its mission became increasingly dissociated from its roots in internationalist campaigns for a new world order, for global democracy and world peace. Struggles Crystal Eastman had always dreamed could march forward together, arm in arm, in the post-war world. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank All right, you. Susan, take us away. Okay, I'm going to now share my screen. And um, here's a start. So um, I want to tell you that about a year and a half ago in the summer of 2019, I was preparing for the ACLU centennial, which as Amy was mentioning, as, as, as you know, is this year, you know, um, 2020. And one of the things that I began to notice was that first of all, 1920 was in addition to being the founding of the ACLU was the year of the 19th amendment. And there were very many uh, women who were involved in the, um, the founding of the ACLU. And a lot of them had been suffragists. Um, this is our hundred year logo thing. And the story of the ACLU, the story of origin is always about Roger Baldwin. He was the first executive director and he was executive director from 1920 until 1950. So you know, I'm always reminded of Ralph Waldo Emerson's statement that an institution is but the length and shadow of one man, because in many ways, I think that's how Roger Baldwin saw himself and how people saw Roger Baldwin. So I started to wonder about who is this Crystal Eastman, who as Amy has just described to you, is really the person who dreamed up the idea of the ACLU in the first place. She had been the director of our predecessor organization. And then she sort of falls out of ACLU history. And all we had on our website were a, a sort of little soundbite or two. So I decided that I was gonna find out Crystal's story. So I set out to do you know, historical research as an amateur historian, and I published a blog piece um, for the ACLU Centennial series, of which this was the illustration, telling the story about, of Crystal as best I could put it together from the um, sources that I was able to you know, find. And one thing that I th found really very surprising and aggravating was that there was no full length biography of Crystal Eastman. Now there were reasons for that, which we could go into you know, on another occasion. But I ended up doing all this laborious research and the last line of the blog as I first drafted it said, and this woman still doesn't have a full length you know, a biography. Well, after I had drafted this, this is where Amy comes into the picture because I then learned that Amy was about to come out with the first full length biography of, of Crystal Eastman. So my only complaint, it's a wonderful book. My only complaint about it is Amy, if you just could have published it six months earlier, you could have saved me a lot of work. <laughs> so, um, just adding a couple of things to Amy's wonderful description of the origins of the ACLU, the people, the places, et cetera. This was one of my favorite pictures in terms of um, the organizing that Crystal did around peace. This is a parade that the um, American Union and I think one of the women's peace parties had um, down Fifth Avenue, I believe it was with Jingo, the armored dinosaur, the no brains. And so I think the one reason why I thought it would be nice to show you this was that where Crystal Eastman began, she was a lawyer, but she never really litigated civil liberties cases. She had a lot of other ideas about organizing. And a lot of the idea that the ACLU began with was dramatic public events and a whole lot of public education. Now, as Amy was also describing, one of the uh, missions of the Civil Liberties Bureau, which was the predecessor organization of the ACLU, was to represent conscientious objectors. 
And Crystal thought she was going to be a lawyer and do test cases, but really she was much more, she turned out to be more of an organizational person. Among the many people who were conscientious objectors was Roger Baldwin, who actually spent about a year in prison because he refused not only to be drafted into the war, he wouldn't even do alternative service. But apparently it didn't much cramp his style to be in prison. He still managed to organize and be highly social. Roger Baldwin, this is a picture of a home where he lived on 11th Street. Uh, Crystal Eastman had been living right down 11th Street at, at what, at 27 West 11th Street. And another very interesting connection was that Madeline Doty, who was Crystal Eastman's roommate, ended up marrying Roger Baldwin. So there are a lot of interpersonal connections going on here. Now, moving from the people into the, um, the, the sort of story of origin of the ACLU, Amy has just told us more than we had ever known about the pre-origins and where the ACLU really came from. But the way that we tell the story of what was going on in 1920 was that there were some things that a whole lot of people were really worried about that they thought needed um, attention. Uh, 1920, as I've been thinking about it with the 100 years reflection, was in some ways just, it, there were uncanny parallels to what we're experiencing today. The nation was just emerging from a pandemic from the 1918 influenza, which President Woodrow Wilson had never mentioned publicly because it was the time of war and he didn't want our enemies to know that people here were sick and they didn't want us to know that they were sick. And that's how it came to be known the Spanish flu as Spanish flu because Spain was neutral in the war. So nobody was trying to hide that information in Spain. In addition, there were very serious problems of people being prosecuted, as Amy was saying, for being unpatriotic if they tried to dissent at all. This is Charles Schenck, who was prosecuted and convicted of a crime for distributing this little leaflet where um, he was arguing that the draft was involuntary servitude and it should be considered unconstitutional. Now that might need, not seem very dangerous to you. And you would also think that the Supreme Court would say people have a right to dissenting speech and should not be convicted of a crime for just saying something that, you know, that they're not agreeing with the, the war or the draft or the government. But the Supreme Court in 1919 unanimously upheld the conviction of Charles Schenck for saying dissident things in an opinion written by our now hero, um, Oliver Wendell Holmes. So there were serious problems with the First Amendment being used to repress not only the dissenting speech of people who didn't agree with the war or the draft of the form of government, but a lot of problems of um, labor organizing and many other places. So the founders of the ACLU really had a coalition of people who were coming from a lot of different places, but who all agreed that it was a problem if the government in fact was able to repress speech and prevent people from organizing. So that's the kind of free speech theme. A second theme, xenophobia. Um, Mitchell Palmer, who was the attorney general at the time, um, launched what were called the Palmer Raids. And I think most people at this point do not study the Palmer Raids in high school history. But if you um, look back at what was happening there, I'm gonna show you the next slide. There was a bomb that was exploded uh, not too far from Attorney General Mitchell's home. So in true Casablanca style, he went out and he had all the usual suspects arrested and the usual suspects were suspected anarchists, suspected communists, people from Eastern Europe, people who were Italian because there were a lot of Italian anarchists. And there are 4,500 persons arrested as you see here nationwide in radical raids, a thousand arrested in New England alone. And obviously they were not all people who were involved with putting a bomb near Attorney General Palmer's door um, where fortunately nobody was injured, but hundreds of people were deported and there was um, people being kept in abusive conditions and interrogated and all sorts of things. So one of the first acts of the ACLU after it was formed was to issue a pamphlet by a lot of prominent attorneys at the time, including Felix Frankfurter, which talked about what was unconstitutional about the Palmer rates. Another was at the issuance of a pamphlet uh, which was about free speech and why free speech was a desirable thing uh, and why people should be allowed to dissent and how that was in fact you know, our, our current saying that uh, dissent is patriotic. Another feature that I became very interested in about our founders in 1920 is that many of them were social workers. Roger Baldwin had been a social worker. There were a lot of social workers around, including Jane Addams. But it's also true that quite a number of them were women. And many of the founders of the ACLU had been suffragists. 
Crystal Eastman herself has spent about a year working in Wisconsin, trying to get Wisconsin to adopt women's suffrage as a state matter. So there were just a lot of connections. And although the people who are usually talked about um, in terms of the ACLU's history, Roger Baldwin and so forth were men, the women were also very much a part of this picture. Uh, so uh, one person who I want to talk to you about who and actually was a man uh, is somebody else who I think doesn't get enough notice, which is quite surprising. Arthur Garfield Hayes was another of the founders of the ACLU, and he was the ACLU's first counsel and very long time counsel. He was either um, general counsel or co-general counsel from 1920 until his death in 1954, which is a pretty long stint, even longer than Roger Baldwin. Now, Arthur Garfield Hayes was born in upstate New York, Rochester, and he went to Columbia, but he moved to Greenwich Village. And this is a famous picture. You've seen this on the, on the um, website here, and I think even on the invitation of Arthur Garfield Hayes standing on a car and talking to a crowd. So what Hayes and Baldwin especially liked to do, they did not at the time think that you could go to the courts and ask the courts to vindicate people's First Amendment rights, because I was just describing in the Shank case, the courts were not there. That just was not something that they did. So Hayes is speaking to a crowd here. And in addition to trying to educate the crowd, one of the things that he and, and Baldwin liked to do was they liked to kind of invite being arrested for an unlawful assembly. You know, there was kind of no such thing as parade permits or assembly permits. So they just waited to see if anybody was going to arrest them. And what they especially liked to do was to read out the text of the First Amendment, the free speech, you know, the freedom of speech. And they liked being arrested for reading the First Amendment to the crowd. So you can again see the sort of organizing strains of Crystal Eastman, you know, going to the public, you know, making these statements, educating the public, etc. So in addition to standing on cars, Arthur Garfield Hayes was a very prominent Greenwich Village resident. This is his home at 24 East 10th Street. And Hayes was married more than once, but his first wife, Blanche Marks, was very closely associated with the Provincetown Playhouse, which some of you may know from McDougal Street. So um, Hayes and his wife had a salon in their home on 10th Street. And in addition to having the kinds of people who hung out at 75th Avenue, the lawyers from the ACLU, uh, and and the um, everyone from the ACLU, from the NAACP, they also hung out with people who surrounded the Provincetown Playhouse, including Eugene O'Neill, uh, Diego Rivera, and Frida Kahlo. They had a lot of associations with Mexico. So it just feels like at the time that everybody in Greenwich Village knew each other, and they were all working on this incredible variety of, um, of, of projects. So Arthur Garfield Hayes currently lives on in um, at both at the ACLU where we have a bust of him in our chief meeting room uh, where people look at our Arthur Garfield Hayes. And the more I hear about Hayes, the more I feel like he was the person who always had everything right. Yeah, he was the great lawyer. He was the mastermind of a lot of the, the cases as I'll tell you about in a minute. But he also lives on in the village because NYU founded only a few years after Hayes died, they founded what they called the Arthur Garfield Hayes Civil Liberties Program. Uh, for many years, the head of the program, the Civil Liberties Program was Norman Dorson, who's my predecessor as ACLU president. And I've always thought it was really very generous of NYU to name this program for Arthur Garfield Hayes since he had actually gone to Columbia, not to NYU. But at this point, there are many dozens of graduates of this program who are also prominent progressive lawyers, civil liberties lawyers, and who've had great careers all over the country. So people remember Arthur Garfield Hayes because his name is on the program, and they remember his name because um, he was the bust. But I want to tell you something about what Hayes was doing when he was actually with the ACLU. So here's 100 years of ACLU logos, for those of you who are graphic people. So you can see how you know, the kind of concept changes over time and a hundred years is a long time. So I'm not gonna to try to tell you everything that we did over a hundred years, but I'm gonna give you a few highlights in a kind of a, a speed dating tour of the ACLU's history. And where it all starts, as Amy says, is 75th Avenue. And it starts with Arthur Garfield Hayes. So um, one of the things, Roger Baldwin, as I said, was a social worker. And although Crystal Eastman and Arthur Garfield Hayes were lawyers, they didn't really expect to get very much from the courts. 
And Roger Baldwin was really, you know, he really was pretty contemptuous of the courts. He didn't think there was much point in bringing a lot of litigation. Uh, he thought that you do much better by you know, asking, by trying to lobby government and by lobbying the public. But Hayes was a pretty great lawyer. And so he, in fact, was the mastermind behind a lot of very important litigation that did involve the ACLU. First case I'll tell you about is the Scopes trial. Okay, if you don't know about the Scopes trial, Mr. Scopes was a high school teacher who was prosecuted under a Tennessee law for teaching the theories of Charles Darwin in high school science. And there was a Tennessee law against doing that. So if you wonder how he came to be prosecuted and becoming a, became a test case for all this, it didn't just happen. Arthur Garfield Hayes planned all this out and he set it all up. And he also figured out the legal strategy and he decided that the person who he wanted to be in trial in, in Tennessee to try the case was Clarence Darrow. So Clarence Darrow tried this case as a cooperating attorney with the ACLU. And in fact, they lost, Scopes was convicted. His conviction was ultimately reversed on, on, on appeal for you know, reasons that are not that interesting to civil libertarians. But if you're interested in this case, if you've ever seen the film Inherit the Wind, that was based on the Scopes trial. So this is one of the um, examples of Arthur Garfield Hayes's you know, masterworks, just figuring out how to challenge this Tennessee statute and that it was important to challenge the Tennessee statute that was uh, you're requiring everybody to um, conform to certain orthodoxies that you weren't allowed to teach the theories of Charles Darwin in Tennessee. Another case that Arthur Garfield Hayes was very much behind, the trial of, um, or involved with, the trial of Sacco and Vanzetti in Massachusetts in 1931 and 32. You can tell that it was a famous trial, even if you've never heard of it, because this is the Ben Sean drawing of Sacco and Vanzetti. And this was a very well-known and controversial case at the time. Uh, Vanzetti and Sacco were two Italian immigrants and they were workmen and they were anarchists. And they were charged with a murder at a factory in, um, in Massachusetts. And they had an extremely unfair trial. It's impossible to say whether or not Sacco was guilty. There are some mixed opinions about that, but I think there's every reason to believe that certainly Vanzetti was innocent. And in any event, they just simply did not have a fair trial. There's a tremendous amount of art around their case. Woody Guthrie wrote a song about them. And Sacco and Vanzetti became a very prominent case. And Arthur Garfield Hayes was involved in the Sacco and Vanzetti Defense Committee, which met at Webster Hall. So if you know of Webster Hall, now a concert venue, there were all these people in New York trying to plan out what to do you know, to try to um, help Sacco and Vanzetti. Well, it turned out that they, they were doomed. They were both executed for this crime and certainly never having had a fair trial. And there were a number of lawyers, again, including uh, Felix Frankfurter was the, the lead, who wrote a book about what had been wrong with this trial. So you can see a theme here that the ACLU has been publishing pamphlets about what's unfair and should be held unconstitutional about the Palmer raids, what was unfair and should be held unconstitutional about the Sacco and Vanzetti trials. And again, not really expecting a lot from the courts themselves, but really trying to bring to the public's awareness the idea of constitutional rights that existed on paper that didn't um, often enough exist beyond paper. Another case that the ACLU was involved in in the background and on appeals were the trials of the Scottsboro Boys, the nine African-American teenagers who were convicted of raping two white women in an incident that almost certainly had never, never happened, great miscarriage of justice. And the ACLU had offered to represent the Scottsboro Boys, but the families of the defendants involved chose, which I think was a mistake, they chose the Communist Party instead, the ILD. And so there are long sagas involving the Scottsboro Boys trial. The case went up to the Supreme Court on several different occasions. And the ACLU was involved in the appeals, but never had a direct role in representation. So you know, who knows how that story would have turned out differently um, had that been otherwise. So moving ahead, maybe a case a, sen a decade from now, uh, during the 1940s, I think the choice has to be the Korematsu case, where the ACLU was really, I think, the only national organization, certainly the only national legal organization, to take the side of people who were being um, removed from their homes um, and in, in put in, in internship camps, et cetera, during World War II. Um, this, of course, is Fred Korematsu, who challenged 
the, uh, the fact that he was being evacuated from his home on the West Coast simply because he was Japanese in origin. And um, you can see the theme of the Palmer raids recurring here. There are all these innocent people who are suffering because of the fact that uh, there was a suspicion that perhaps not all Japanese in the United States were loyal. The ACLU is still soul searching about the Korematsu case about, and the, the entire Japanese internment program <coughs> because the national organization was not as advanced as our California affiliates. So if you read the histories, there's a lot of discussion about the California affiliates trying to force the hand of the national organization. So that's interesting history, but nevertheless, a very important um, point of, again, you know, kind of realizing what's wrong with giving the government too much discretion and the need to push back against government discretion. One of the things that has been discovered um, in, by one historian was that a lot of the evidence that the government showed the Supreme Court to argue that in fact there was known disloyalty among Japanese or Japanese Americans on the West Coast was evidence that simply was not true. There, there was just you know, some real manufactured evidence. 1950s, the case has to be Brown versus Board of Education. This was not an ACLU case, but the ACLU wrote an amicus brief, a very fine amicus brief participating in the case. And that amicus brief was one of the last acts of Arthur Garfield Hayes. He died at the end of 1954, but this was you know, one of his last um, occasions to represent the ACLU in Brown. The 1960s, of course, a fair amount happened. Um, one case I have to single out is, can you believe that it wasn't until 1967 that the Supreme Court held that it was unconstitutional for a state to prohibit people from marrying somebody of another race? Okay, so this is an ACLU case, also a major motion picture, um, an, an amazing and important occurrence. Also at the end of 1960s is Mary Beth Tinker, in a case where the Supreme Court holds that students have a right to express their political opinions. Mary Beth and her brother wanted to wear black armbands as a protest against the war in Viet Vietnam. And I'll tell you that Mary Beth Tinker is still an activist. She's on the board of directors of the ACLU in the District of Columbia and a union organizer. And she recently had a bus going around the country in what she called the Tinker Tours, talking to high school students all over the country about the First Amendment and constitutional rights. Okay, now in the 1970s, of course, what we have to pick out is the notorious RBG. And I wanna take a kind of a point of privilege here by telling you that since Ariel, since I sent the bio to Ariel that she read out in the introduction of me, I have now um, been awarded a new chair. And so my actual title right now at Brooklyn Law School is I am the Ruth Bader Ginsburg Professor of Law. So I couldn't be more pleased with that. I feel inspired and honored every time I look at my email signature. And I don't need to tell you, because this also has been a major motion picture as well as a major documentary, how Ruth Bader Ginsburg set out to convince a Supreme Court of all men that gender discrimination is a denial of equal protection and unconstitutional on behalf of people like you know, Sharon Frontiero. Brief moment, um, the case that RBG would have liked the Supreme Court to hear before Roe v. Wade was a case where she was representing Captain Susan Strzok in the Air Force, who when she became pregnant was told that she would have to leave the Air Force because you couldn't both be in the Air Force and pregnant at the same time. And what uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg wanted the court to see was that forcing women to not have reproductive freedom to make a choice was unconstitutional. And she wanted them to start, not with a woman who wanted to have an abortion, but with a woman who wanted to remain pregnant. So part of what's so inspiring to me about Ruth Bader Ginsburg's le legacy is not only the amount of law that she changed and accomplished, but her incredible strategic vision. And also the fact that when she got to the point on the Supreme Court where she could no longer win cases, she just learned how to be the greatest dissenter that ever there was. But speaking of Roe v. Wade, the ACLU also wrote an amicus brief in Roe v. Wade and we can talk about that during the Q&A if you want, but Roe v. Wade, as you know, is now seriously under siege in all these different states. The ACLU has 50 affiliates all around the country. And so the ACLU affiliates have been involved in so much litigation about all these different kinds of abortion restrictions. And as you know, there's a lot of discussion with the changing composition of the Supreme Court now that Justice Ginsburg is no longer there about whether Roe v. Wade itself might be overruled. 
So again, if that's what you'd like to talk about during um, the question and answer, that would be fine. Um, my case from the 2000s, Clapper versus Amnesty International, was a case where we represented the Amnesty International in a challenge to covert surveillance programs. And the Supreme Court held that Amnesty International did not have standing and would not be allowed to challenge the covert surveillance program that they believed was being applied to them because they could not prove that they were the subjects of covert surveillance. Now, when you think about it, bit of a catch 22, right? The point of covert surveillance is they don't actually tell you whether you're the subject. This was the case where Edward Snowden, who is also an ACLU client, said that he read this case and he thought, I'd better become a whistleblower. The courts are not gonna be able to take care of this. So that was the case of the 2000s. From the 2010 era, I think the case I'd have to single out is our great client, Jim Obergefell, where the um, marriage equality had been a goal of the ACLU and something we've been working on, again, through affiliates throughout the country for, for decades. But it finally, in fact, the ACLU brought a case of Minnesota in the 19, early 1970s, arguing that Minnesota should let two men get married. Uh, they weren't ready for that at the time. So where I wanna end up here is with the current day. And I wanna give you a film recommendation again. There's this great documentary called The Fight produced by Kerry Washington and others, where what she does is she follows four different fairly current ACLU cases. One of the people she follows, one of our heroes, is Dale Ho, who's the director of our Voting Rights Project. And um, she follows the case in which he litigated whether or not the Census Department could add a question asking about people's citizenship, which everybody agreed would have dissuaded people from filling out the census and given us an inaccurate account. And in fact, he won the case before the Supreme Court. But in the film, in the fight, you get to actually see him preparing for the case and what he's arguing, et cetera. So the Dale was also the um, head of all of the uh, fight against voter suppression and the fight to try to keep the 2020 election fair and before and after. So a lot going on in the voting rights area. Um, the second, another area covered in the fight is um, anti-trans bills that are all over the country. So you can also see people working on fighting those kinds of laws and discrimination. And this is now beyond the fight, but I wanna tell you about another thing that the ACLU did recently, which was to challenge the travel ban, President Trump's travel ban that came into effect uh, in the first week that he was president. So this is Hamid Darwish, who is Iraqi. And if you had to make up a plaintiff to challenge the travel ban, you couldn't make anyone up who would be better. He was very pro-American and he worked with the American military as a translator. So he would go out with American troops and when they were dressed in their body armor, he would be dressed in his baseball cap and sweatshirt. And he is crediting for, credited for having saved the lives of a number of American troops. So he and his family were finding that it wasn't that popular with their neighbors in Iraq to be that pro-American and they were having a very hard time. So they made the difficult decision to emigrate to the United States and um, it took two years. For two years, he was vetted and had hearings and filled out forms until finally he was given a visa and was allowed to fly to the United States in advance of his family. And while he was on the plane, President Trump's travel ban went into effect. So when he arrived at Kennedy Airport, he was detained, for, it was 19 hours, and he was told that he wasn't allowed to be in the United States because he had to be vetted before he could be in because he was from one of these countries and that was too dangerous. So the ACLU lawyer stayed up all night and you know, wrote a complaint and went to the Eastern District Court in Brooklyn and got an order from a judge. It was the first court order blocking the executive order that banned refugees. So this is legal learned who you could also see in the fight, one of our um, immigrants rights lawyers. And that's Anthony Romero, who's the executive director of the ACLU. And uh, this is from a little uh, video that somebody just took on their camera, which went viral and like millions of people saw it. And even between the time that the ACLU lawyers went into the courthouse and the time they came out to tell the crowd about what had just happened, the crowd had just been magnified because everybody had been seeing on social media and wanted to come to the Eastern District Courthouse. So there were you know, like hundreds of people there when Lee and Anthony came out chanting, ACLU, we are here to stand with you. So after this, Anthony said one day in a meeting, he said, now how many people at the ACLU do we have working on social media? And he suddenly got it that, you know, maybe we needed to have more people in social media. 
Um, as you know, the Supreme Court ultimately ruled against us and everybody else that found that the travel ban was constitutional. Another case that Lee has worked on is a case involving a woman from the Democratic uh, Republic of Congo, who when she arrived in um, San Diego as a refugee, was found to have a credible claim that she was fleeing persecution. So she was locked up while, her, um, he, while she was gonna have a hearing and her six-year-old daughter was sent to Chicago and was incarcerated without her. So Ms. L and, and her daughter became the face of the ACLU's lawsuit against ICE. Um, as you know, that litigation is still continuing. There's still hundreds of families who are you know, not reunited because the government did not keep track of where they were you know, sending the, the parents and the children. But this wonderful cartoon is by a young friend of mine, Sasha Matthews, who when she was 13, started doing political cartooning. And uh, she has a website, if you're interested, called Rumble Comics, but isn't this beautiful? Anyway, she had said that she wanted to use her cartooning talents to tell a story of an ACLU case. And I suggested this case to her and she just did a fabulous job. This uh, series of cartoons was published by The Nation and Kamala Harris, among other people, noticed it. You know, so there are now photos of, of Sasha visiting Kamala Harris in her office. And um, I won't spoil the uh, end of the story for you, but if you watch the fight, you will also see Ms. L and you'll see her with her daughter. So another good reason to watch the film. So there's one of our logos and whoever could have believed in 1920 that one thing that the ACLU would be doing would be reuniting families. That another thing that we would be doing during the pandemic was keeping prisoners from dying but you're arguing that you know, that you cannot you know, keep people in the cramped and unsanitary conditions that, that prisoners and detainees are being kept in. So in some ways, we're a long way from the beginning of 1920, but in some ways, it's all the same thing. This is a, 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 a it shows the three different centers that we have in the ACLU, which gives you a sense of the 14 different areas in which we work. And getting back to our original theme, one thing that I will tell you is that there, another of our historians, Leanne Wheeler, who wrote a history of how the ACLU came to treat sexual freedom as a civil liberty, which is an interesting history. Her title that she had on her original article was, um, what, what did she call it? It was something like, uh, oh, Where Else But Greenwich Village? So she really attributes yeah, the origins of the ACLU and everything we've done since to our village, um, to our Greenwich Village origins. So um, on my rusting side to follow us, I just, I'll say one thing in terms of where we are now in the future, and then I'd look forward to if anybody has any questions. So in the last four years, we have brought over 400 legal actions against the Trump administration, because you just saw the 14 areas in which we work, and the Trump administration has been working in all 14 areas, just in the opposite direction. So now that we're about to have a different president, evidently, uh, we are not ready to hang out the mission accomplished banner because first of all, our staff believes that we have sued every president in our hundred years of existence. And I think that President Biden would be no exception. We will find something to sue him about. The other thing that I can tell you is that we also have our affiliates in all 50 states and there are one or two civil liberties problems in the states. You know, it's contagions of anti-reproductive freedom statutes, voting rights problems, anti-immigrant laws, etc. So the question that people often ask me is, well, you know, now that the Supreme Court has become so conservative, now that Justice Barrett has replaced Justice Ginsburg, what are you gonna do? You know, what does the ACLU do now? And my answer is in some ways we're back to 1920, back when the ACLU could not rely on the courts and just had to come up with other strategies. And I think I wanna finish by quoting Roger Baldwin, who once said, and I think this is in some ways a reassuring thought, he said, no civil liberties battle ever remains won. Now, I think that's true. I think we don't just see you know, progress in a positive or negative direction. I think our history has been pendulum swings. And so where the ACLU staff is right now is we are going to be working as hard as we can to keep push, pushing the pendulum back in the right direction. Well, thank you. And I look forward to hearing what you all wanna talk about now. Thank you both so much. I learned a lot in this past hour and I'm so, so very grateful. Um, we have a couple of questions, though I hope that the folks who are with us will, will contribute some more uh, of those. So I will, I will start with what we've got. Um, 
Joe asked a question about 75th Avenue and um, is it, it's part, it's part of the, the new school campus now. Do you know if there's any um, recognition of the, the history of that building? I don't. I would, uh, you know, I would ask you, Ariel, if you, if you, you know, know if there's any progress on it. I know, you know, I know that the application has been made, um, you know, to to recognize that building among others. Um, but I, I, you know, I haven't heard any update uh, on on, you know, whether there's any word on it. That is something that Village Preservation is fighting for very, very much. <laughs> um. Yeah, and that that's it's ongoing. It's ongoing for sure, as as far as I know. Um, also, Cynthia wants to know: Has the support for the ACLU increased since the current presidency? The current presidency? Well, you could say yes. Um, after Donald Trump was elected, our membership quadrupled. Wow. <laughs> what I like to say is, yeah, I think people just realized how necessary we are, <laughs> and what. But again. The fact, it's not only about one person and who's in the presidency, it's about problems all over the country and you know, all sorts of things that are going on. So during the entire hundred years, the ACLU has always been needed for something. And Trumpism in one form or another has always been with us, just in different places at different times in different ways. But we really appreciate all our supporters because you know, we couldn't do the amount of work we're doing without the fabulous support we've been getting. That is very true. Um, I also had a question from Jeffrey about the founders of the ACLU um, and their stances on World War I um, and on communist Russia and the USA. Were they, I know, I know most things were domestic, but was, was there a consensus? What, what were people's takes on those things? Um, there wasn't consensus. In fact, that was really a consistent um, point of tension was the, you know, um, the, 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 the leftist versus the moderates, you know, within the organization um, for a variety of reasons, um, you know, some, uh, you know, actual politics, some, you know, more kind of strategic positioning, you know, the way uh, Wald and Kellogg both um, felt they needed, you know, to maintain contacts in a kind of wider community of people who um, were, you know, kind of clearly on the side of capital, you know, and would not, uh, were not supporters of the Russian Revolution or, or communism. Um, uh, but, you know, Crystal Eastman and a, a few others um, were, you know, were supportive of um, the Russian Revolution. Eastman herself was a socialist, although not a ever a card carrying member of the Socialist Party. Um, but um, she really moved farther to the left, um, you know, out because the Bolsheviks so quickly signed a peace treaty with Germany. Um, she was still, you know, what, what, what really motivated her, at least from the letters that she left behind, you know, that I was, that I read for the book, was um, the, you know, the idea of a new social order coming out of, um, yeah, coming out of uh, cooperative kind of world peace, you know, negotiated peace, treaty-based mediated peace agreements. Um, and so, you know, she already, you know, had the kind of foundation, leftward foundation, but, you know, that's really what pushed her uh, across uh, and pushed her into such, you know, avid support um, of the revolution and, and, and of being, uh, moving her farther to the left. Um, she had a few colleagues, um, you know, Norman Thomas was, you know, was involved. He was, you know, obviously a, a, um, an established socialist. Um, so there were a few who were with her on the farther, farther to the left. Um, but there was a always a real divide um, within the organization. And, you know, you know, as, as I discovered in researching the book and talked a little bit about tonight, that's why the ACLU became a separate organization. Um, if it had not been for that divide, um, or at least in part because of that divide, the civil liberties work would have continued within the American Union Against Militarism. And, you know, it's very possible that the, you know, that both would have disappeared <laughs> um, you know, with the passage of time, or perhaps with the, you know, the pressures from um, government suppression, or perhaps at the end of the war. 
Um, so, you know, in, a, in an interesting way, if it were, were it not for that tension, were it not for that split and that those arguments within the organization, we might not have had the ACLU as we know it today. So let me pick up on the two themes there from after the ACLU was founded and did exist, because um, one theme was about communism. Roger Baldwin had for a while been attracted to the Communist Party, and then he got over it. And then we've had in our past, we've had people on the board who were communists, and there were there continued to be internal divisions about whether you could succeed at being the ACLU and also have communists in your ranks. So that was one story. About, and there are still people who write me hate mail and say, the ACLU is a communist organization. And I think it was, not much of that is based on a sophisticated understanding of the history. I think it's more based on people not understanding how the ACLU can represent communists, socialists, fascists, you know, whoever, without agreeing with what they say, just arguing that they should get to say whatever they say. So the communism is one theme. Another theme is the theme of internationalism. So Crystal Eastman was very much an internationalist. She was involved in the international women's peace movement. And Roger Baldwin also would have liked to see the ACLU be international and not just be the American Civil Liberties Union in the United States. But the board, the initial board did not agree with him and insisted that the mandate was only gonna be domestic. So it was quite a while before we really kind of turned our faces to the rest of the world. We still do not, you know, I get letters also, you know, not hate men, but you know, desperate pleas from people in countries all over the world saying, can't the ACLU please help me with my civil liberties problem in X country? And the answer is no, yeah, that's not our mission. But we have become more international in two different ways. One of which is that we started a human rights program not too many years ago, and we rely a lot on international treaties and conventions and we actually will go to Geneva or go to the Organization of American States to argue on the basis of international law, not just the United States Constitution. And another is that we are now part of a coalition that's called the International Network of Civil Liberties Organizations, INCLO, I-N-C-L-O, if anyone wants to look it up, where we have coalition partners in a lot of English speaking countries like uh, the UK and Ireland, but also in Argentina, and you know, a bunch of other countries where we compare notes and we get together to talk about worldwide problems of um, freedom of religion or um, restrictions on demonstrations or things like that. So that's, you know, it's been a turn that I think both Crystal and, and Roger Baldwin would have liked that we're now we're a little more outward facing, but we're still only a domestic organization. So interesting, thank you for that. Um, we have, Oh, we have more questions. Um, Felicia wants to know, outside of New York, what are the oldest ACLU affiliates and what prompted that, that formation? Okay, that's an interesting question. So I went to the 90th anniversary of the ACLU of Massachusetts, which they had before the founding of the National ACLU. So you know, they claim to actually have been founded before the, the main ACLU. So oh. we're most of the affiliates were in the East, and it was it took a while for um, you know, the, the country to kind of fill in. Uh, so I can tell you, I think the ACLU of Massachusetts would probably claim the oldest affiliate status. Uh, we also have, I was saying that there were 50 affiliates, but it's not even one per state. We have three different affiliates in California. California, which has always been and still is a real hotbed. You know, the, the, we have you know, some of our largest memberships and most enthusiastic members all over California. And again, they, they were the ones who were really the champs during World War II. They really wanted to stand up against the government when people on the national board were feeling a lot more cautious. So it's the, the national versus state is so, it's such an interesting dynamic. Yeah. Um, possibly along that line, we have a question about Skokie. And if you would like okay. to comment well, what, on what that. Is the, what is the, oh, just, is that the question? Go yeah. the question mark? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> okay, well, for those of you who, who, um, who don't know about Skokie, the problem there was that in Illinois, they were trying to prevent a demonstration of people who were self-styled Nazis, American Nazis. And Skokie was a city where there were a number of people who lived who were Holocaust survivors. Now, what people always talk about, which is wrong, and Amy, I don't know if you know this, they always talk about the Nazis marching through Skokie. The Nazis never marched through Skokie. They never asked to march through Skokie. They wanted to pick it in front of the courthouse. They did not want to walk past the houses of, and homes in the residential neighborhoods where there were Holocaust survivors. 
So if anyone's interested in the, in the, um, the real story, there's a great history by Philippa Strum, S-T-R-U-M, uh, called The Day the Nazis Came to Skokie or something like that. And so what happened was that the ACLU of Illinois became involved in the case and defended them because they were being denied their permit on the basis of what they wanted to say. There is from the 1930s, there's a pamphlet that I've seen where some of the original ACLU founders wrote about, should we defend Nazis when they want to explain their theories? And the answer was yes. And the whole theory was, you know, sort of the classic First Amendment theory of the marketplace of ideas. So what we think the First Amendment means is that the government has to be content neutral about speech. They cannot deny Black Lives Matter the right to have a protest because they don't like what they're saying. And they cannot deny white supremacists the right to have a permit because they don't like what they're saying. Because once you start getting the government into that business, then it's no longer the individual's right to decide what to say. And the government is controlling what we say. So that's the basic principle of content neutrality and of free speech. And so after Skokie, there were a lot of people who um, decided that you know, they didn't agree with that that they agreed more with results and that they didn't like the idea that the ACLU was defending people saying things that they didn't agree with. I think that unless you start defending people in the controversial areas, you know, nobody's gonna stop you from saying, I love my mother and apple pie is great. So you, it has to be on the backs of the really controversial cases. So the ACLU um, after Skokie experienced a drop in membership. There were a number of members who said, that's not what I want to do. And the executive director at the time, Ira Glasser, really set out to um, explain to the members of the ACLU the basic idea of civil liberties um, and, and the idea of, of the content neutrality that you can't always choose the results. We feel the same about voting. We don't just do the things that will enable Democrats to win, we're nonpartisan. What we think is that there should just be fair ways of having the elections and everybody should get to vote and then whoever wins, wins. So the, um, there was a great letter written to the ACLU members by David Goldberger, who was the lawyer in the ACLU of Illinois, who was the lawyer in Skokie. And the organization really you know, thrived after that. You know, people did understand what was going on. And there were a lot of, you know, the organization needed some administrative you know, uh, rebooting anyway. So you know, that's my very short version of Skokie, but you know, it's on our website. It's also in the longer version in Flipstrom's history. But you know, people keep talking about the, the Nazis marching in Skokie. And there was a judge who put that into his opinion and it's wrong. They never marched and they never asked to march. So interesting, yeah. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, I'm gonna ask two more questions. Jean wants to know, can you talk about civil liberties and COVID? Do you anticipate a situation in which masks and vaccinations are made mandatory and arguments will advance in the court that such laws threaten civil liberties? Wow, um, you know, my husband who's sitting next to me just <laughs> laughed when, when he heard that question, not because it's not a wonderful question, because one thing that I was doing this afternoon, right in this very room, was teaching my seminar that I'm teaching this semester at the law school called COVID-19 on the Constitution. So we've been spending 13 weeks on a different topic every week. And the topic being that you were mentioning is one, you know, can they make you wear a mask and can they make you not open your business? And the answer is yes, they can, but that's not you know, considered something that is a violation of your civil liberties. There are a number of other places where health regulations could violate your civil liberties. Um, for example, um, a house of worship could in fact be limited by the same kinds of rules that any other business would be limited by. You can't have like hundreds of people in a small space, but you can't single out religion and you can't single out particular religions. Other areas where this comes up, the um, contact tracing, the kinds of things where you, can we find out whether, who's sick and, and keep track of them. And that the constitution has something to say about in the fourth amendment, which prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures. I was mentioning before all the prisoners and detainees who are becoming ill because you know, it's cruel and unusual punishment. They're being forced to be locked up in these very dense environments where they cannot protect themselves. And so you know, we ask the courts to protect them there. So they're just, you know, Jean, I could send you my syllabus. There's a whole lot to say. But if you want to know more about that, I actually gave a talk at the Brooklyn Public Library a few weeks ago, which is called COVID, COVID and the Constitution. And um, it's available on the Brooklyn Public Library's Facebook page. And I've had I think, other things that I won't try to get into now about how COVID has exposed and exploited some of the deficiencies in our constitution. 
So it's a great question. And if you're interested in more answer, I recommend the Brooklyn Public Library Facebook site. Ah, and I believe that I just found the link to it. So I will, nice of you. I will, um, this is not it, but I will find it everyone and I will put it, I will put it in our follow-up email so that oh, that's so very you, nice. can, you can check it out. Um, We've just gotten so many amazing questions and it's 720, which is later than I usually go. So I'm going to ask one last one from Sylvia, who says you both rock, which is not a question, but is a fact. <laughs> um, and her we, we were talking about this earlier before before the event started. So I'm I'm excited to bring this uh, to the public. Uh, Sylvia asks in our lives, we have looked to the Supreme Court to protect civil liberties and rights. That is no longer true. What would Crystal and Roger advise? <laughs> Amy, you want to start? I would say Crystal would advise taking to the streets. That was, you know, she was, that was always, direct action was always her most kind of natural, you know, her, her natural talent, her natural inclination. Um, although I will say that she, all of her life, you know, really believed in the courts, always consistently was trying to create test cases, was trying to go to the courts to make them do what she believed they should do. Um, some of her faith in the courts may have come from the fact that she was trained as a lawyer, um, but was unable to ever practice law in her career. She always wanted to. Um, when she you know, first entered the suffrage campaign, she only did so as a fallback plan because she couldn't get a job practicing law and had tried everywhere, had tried everything. Um, and um, you know, she always you know, kind of had that drive and wanted to do that. So I think that fed a kind of lifelong, um, a lifelong faith or a lifelong desire to, you know, to, to get her interests to go into the courts and you know, combine her political goals with um, you know, sort of judicial procedures. Um, but, you know, her most natural inclination in her life, what she lived out, what she constantly did, what she was best at organizing, as Susan mentioned, what she was best at was organizing direct actions. And I think, um, you know, it, in, in the face of any kind of um, obstacles to her goals, you know, that, that would have been what she advised. Organized, go out in the streets, you know, don't, you know, don't be afraid don't stop until you get, you know, you get the progress that you deserve. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I think that, you know, as I was saying before, I feel like in some ways we're back to 1920 when you couldn't count on the courts. And the only reason that we think you should be able to count on the courts to enforce our First Amendment rights is all those cases that the ACLU and other organizations brought for you know, most of the 20th century. The courts didn't start thinking that. The First Amendment was a paper right and the courts were not enforcing it. They didn't enforce it for a long time. I think the current court will continue to enforce the First Amendment. I don't think that's where our problems lie. But I think if the courts aren't there, I think Crystal also, in addition to being an organizer, she was an improviser. And that's how she ended up thinking up the, the idea of civil liberties. She had to pivot because you couldn't just be an anti-war activist because then you would be prosecuted. So I feel like, you know, in that spirit, the spirit of Crystal Eastman improvising and adapting and the spirit of Ruth Bader Ginsburg improvising, if you can't get together a majority opinion, you write a killer dissent. We'll go to the streets, we'll go to the public opinion, we'll go to the press and we will rebuild. As one of my colleagues was just saying, it's not a revolution, it's an evolution. Mm. Thank you so much. I love, I, I feel like an ending on that is a great, it's a great way to end. Um, I just, I'm so grateful to you both uh, for your time and your knowledge and your work. And I'm so grateful to everyone who is here with us. Thank you so much. Um, and um, have a great, have a great night. Get out into the streets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, start organizing. Yes. Yes. And, yes. and you can visit aclu.org if you want to find out more. Great. Yes, and villagepreservation.org too. I can't say Absolutely. we're we're working for constitutional rights, but we certainly <laughs> are doing lots of community organizing. So that's uh, where it be, being being involved in your neighborhood is a great start. So thank you, thank you again. I'm so I'm so so grateful. Uh, good night, everyone. Good night. Thank good you. Night. Bye. Bye.